Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dee Fair. I work in the external education. It is on, okay. Exter external education for Google. I'm a program manager over in the engineering office. And um, it is a total pleasure to introduce Dr. David Kirp, with, who is here today. Um, most of you have heard of him before. He is the James D. Marver Professor of Public Policy over at the Goldman School in UC Berkeley. And was the founding director of Harvard's uh, Law and Education Center, uh, which is doing some really great education equality uh, projects right now, so you might want to check that out. And uh, if that were not enough, <laughs> he's also part of uh, Obama's transition team that, and worked, you know, was part of that very critical time in the two months before the 2009 inauguration. Doesn't uh, that seem like a long time ago? And you've done so much since. So since then, and they haven't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in you know, ever the slacker, Dr. Kerb uh, has been a prolific author. Seventeen books, hundreds and hundreds of of articles and commentary in the New York Times, the L.A. Times, the Huffington Post, the Atlantic Monthly, Slate, the Nation. So uh, you are in for a big treat, and it is my pleasure to welcome him. I hope you will as well. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming. Um, and um, I'm just comparing the, the turnout to the last time I was here. More folks. Um, and last time I was talking about kids generally. I want to focus on um, K-12 education or pre-K-12 education today. And I'll tell you the story of one school district in northern New Jersey, Union City, New Jersey. And I wonder why I'm doing that. Well. Um, the sort of the here's why you should listen message is this is one of the hundred poorest cities in the country. It's the most crowded city in the country. That doesn't mean high rises. That means immigrant families living three or four to an apartment, each behind a locked bedroom door, one shelf in the refrigerator, that kind of poverty. One and a half times the poverty rate, one and a half times the unemployment rate, very few college graduates among the folks who are living there. Um, the kids come to school, 75% um, of them uh, come from families where the language of the home is Spanish, so it's football and not football, and it's the telenovela, you know, and not the reality TV show. So if you look around at schools in neighborhoods like this, even around here, uh, by and large, um, those schools are failing these kids. And, and um, indeed, they're the, the leading, you know, they're the, they're, they're the sort of leading edge or where the critics are saying, look, you know, the public schools can't do it. Um, they're old fashioned, 19th century solution to 21st century problems. What we need is a dose of market discipline in the story. That means we want to hire and fire teachers based on test score growth. Um, we want to close failing schools. Um, we want to open charter schools to create competition with uh, public schools. Um, those are the only answers, goes the, the, the wrap of the, of the day. And I want to use Union City as one example of why that misses the mark in many, that critique misses the mark in many ways. And I'm picking this one place but I'm going to tell you about districts all across the country, big, little, uh, black, Latino, Asian, white, that are doing the same kinds of things with the same kinds of results. Um, so why should you pay attention? Here's a, here is a community where, at one point, schools were so terrible that the state was about to take them over. I don't know how many of you come from the East Coast and know about Camden, New Jersey. So if you think about Camden, New Jersey, just think about the worst place you've ever been in and multiply it by two, and that's Camden, New Jersey. That was the worst school district in the state, and so the cheer in, in Union City was, thank God for Camden. Um, so that was then, this is now, the graduation rate in this uh, community is 91%. Now to put that in context, the national average graduation rate is 76%. Um, I looked up Sequoia High, not so very far from here up in Redwood City, because I was 
talking to a group there last night, in the high 80s, Berkeley in the mid 80s. So just to give you a feel for where this, where this is situated. You know, in a, and 75% of these um, graduates go on to college of one kind or another. Um, how did they do it? Um, there are no, there's no drama, no fireworks in this story. And since I'm in a world where, you, where business is part of the conversation, I sort of take part of my text from an interview that Reed Hastings, um, the CEO at Netflix, gave, did with the New York Times last March or April. And you may recall the Netflix debacle when they went to the new Netflix model and people hated them. And now they're back, right? It's the best recovery since Coke and New Coke. Um, and so people said, so the guy said, what did you do? And he said, the pressure was to do something dramatic and fast and really be out there in the world. And I realized that I needed to gain the trust of people who were there. I needed to go back to basics. I needed to show that we knew how to do it. I needed to make improvements at the margin, you know, improvements at the margin, like the shows that Netflix runs now. So that message, you could take that message and translate it to the school story I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell. Um, any of you heard of, of Edward Deming? Is that a familiar name here? Probably the management guru of the late 20th century. Um, the US companies weren't interested, so in the 1980s he goes to Japan. He is the guy that's credited with a, with a quote, Japanese miracle. And then he comes back, and you get a lot of Fortune 100 companies paying a lot of attention to him. And, and the Deming message is really very simple. It's a continuous improvement message. You're always looking at the margin for changes and tinkering. You know, it's a programmer's message, right? I mean, you fix the bugs. You keep fixing the bugs. You keep adding new things at the margin. Um, and little kids, um, I suspect there aren't many parents of preschoolers around this room, but you know little kids. And little kids, one of the great programs for little kids is called Highscope. And the model in Highscope is very simple. Kids get together at the beginning of class and they talk about what they want to do. There are all these options in the classroom. They go off and do them. The teacher comes around, helps out when the kids are, are puzzled. So they do what they're going to be about doing. And then they come back and sit around the table and review what they learned. Plan, do, review. So if it works for kindergartners and it works for business, it actually turns out to work for schools. Union City now, how did Union City get from there to here? <coughs> By adopting a model that makes total sense to anybody who <coughs> thinks about what kids need. It's a system of support for students from preschool through high school. Um, this is an immigrant community. So with these kids not speaking English, one of the first tasks was to was to make them fluent in English. But they didn't do it by dropping them in an English language class or an ESL class. They started in Spanish because any linguist is going to tell you that if, you are, if you've got a native language, you need to learn it well. You need to understand how to speak it, write it, read it. You've got to get the grammar. Otherwise, this is always this half-form language. It's going to be in the back of your head and getting in the way of your learning English. So they start with Spanish, and they slowly and gradually move to English. The pace of the moving is individualized, depending upon the kids' needs. Um, so kids are constantly being shuffled at tables in classrooms. What do they need in English, and what, how are they doing? You know, what's their ability? They double, sort of a, a double metric that they use. Um, kids from very poor families um, don't get the kind of verbal attention that parents in middle class and professional families give their kids. Um, parents, are, parents of middle class kids are asking their kids questions. Hopefully they're not just learning how to count from 1 to 10 and do the alphabet. But it's kind of like, you know, if I take this bottle like this kid and I do this, did it disappear? How am I going to make it come back? Oh, came back. How did that happen? That's a middle class parents move. Um, they also talk to their kids and listen to their kids. There was a very obsessive, compulsive social scientist who actually counted the number of words that children from, from poor, working class, middle class, and professional families heard. But by the time they were four years old, 
the kids from professional families had heard 30 million more words than the kids from the poorest families. And I used to stop there, but last week, um, some researchers at Stanford showed the same thing was true for kids at 18 months and 24 months. The same level of comprehension, comprehension at 18 months and, and some word and use, and at, and at 24 months as you had. So that meant that the curriculum had to be word drenched, literature drenched, language drenched, all over the boards. They're reading stories, they're listening to stories, they're writing stories. They're graduating to nonfiction to be able to sort of sort out what's going on, that set of materials. Um, so those are, the, those are the two basics things they did. When money for preschool came along, in, and in New Jersey, uniquely, there's a court order that says every poor district gets money to put up two years of high quality full day preschool, three and four year olds. And a lot of the communities squandered it. There, What's going on in Union City here and elsewhere passes what I call the policy version of the golden rule test. And so if you're thinking about equity and fairness, here's my real simple measure. And you're thinking about kids. Would what's going on be good enough for a child that I love? Real simple. Doesn't mean it has to be as fancy or elaborate or, you know, um, but, it, but it needs to really get the basics for kids. And that's what, that is what Union City did in preschool. It's what it, what it did with uh, teachers at the school. These, I was really pretty snobby when I got to Union City. I thought, these are teachers who come from places that I've never, schools that I've never heard of, and I used to study higher education. How can they be any good? And you go to those classrooms, and I'm actually now trying to work with a film company to get some of those teachers on film and get them shown in a TV show. Um, they're, they are, the best of them are astonishingly good. Um, they didn't learn it, they'll tell you, they didn't learn it in, in teacher's college. They learned it on the job and they learned it from other teachers. So the emphasis is on collaboration, not on competition, not the teacher sits alone. You know, again, just think about how you guys learn here and translate that to the ways in which teachers and schools are gonna learn. A first year teacher, they all said to me variations on a theme of, I would cry every night when I went home. It was just so tough to do. But they'd all have mentors. If they were struggling with a particular subject, a master teacher in the school would come and show them a lecture, co-teach a lecture, and then watch while the newbie was doing the talk. And down the road, that newbie became the master teacher who would be doing the same thing for the newcomers in the school. As you know, Standardized tests are the coin of the realm. We really emphasize reading and math obvious, for obvious reasons. Those are perquisites for success. We don't emphasize, as a result, science and history and art and music and lots of other things. Physical education, an hour a week, turns out now to be the, the norm in, in public schools. It's all focused on reading and math. And we can talk about the wisdom of that. Um, but Union City's got to play by those rules that they're going to be. That's their calling card also. They do better than average in New Jersey, a very well-to-do state that does very well overall in the standardized test. If New Jersey was a country, nobody would be worried about where America's standing was in the world. They ranked fourth or fifth in, the, in math and, and reading on the international PISA exam. So to do better than average, pretty astonishing. Those kids are assessed during the course of the year. They don't wait for the spring. They do preliminary exams, and they can slice and dice them in any way, shape, or form. They've got, pro I imagine that the people who do programming here would look at this program and say, this is, this is good stuff. I mean, you ask any question about the results. You know, did Teacher X do as well this year as last year? Did Teacher X do as well as other teachers in the around? Did te how is Teacher X doing with kids who've been in the country for more or less than five years. On the math test, how did the kids do on the word problems as opposed to the number of problems, and on and on, anything you might want to know. And if you're in that sort of market, you know, discipline and punish world, this is very cool stuff because you can beat up teachers with this if you want to. That's not what Union City does. They use it for two reasons. They use it to support the 
kids who are having problems. The focus what it is that those kids need, and they use it to help the teachers. So that when they're bringing in professionals to help the teachers, and they do, and they're bringing in outside experts to help the teachers, they focus on the things that are weaknesses for those teachers. And they, do, they bring people in rather than sending folks out to conferences. In, in teacher land, you go off to a conference and some expert gives you his or her rap. You come back. Um, it's known as spray and pray. Right? Give it all to everybody and just hope that something sticks. That's not what they do. They, they're working in that school. And those are pretty basic things to be doing inside the school. Importantly, they connect parents to this process. Um, in, a, in my last book, which is called Kids First, I talk about the critical importance of what parenting programs look like and early education, and a lot of examples there of sort of what works. Um, but if you don't have parents engaged in children's learning, you are, you're starting out with two strikes behind because they're there from the beginning and you know the school is open six hours a day, 180 days a year. A lot of the rest of the time is spent with families. And so they bring the families in, they make them part of the educational process, and they reach out to the families. Remember, this is a really poor community. So there's going to be a liaison to the parent community, to the parents living in the neighborhood. And the parent says, how do I get on the waiting list for, the ho for housing? How do I help get my kid you know, a summer job? You know, can you help me figure out what the paperwork is in involved in to get a green card? And these folks don't need to look it up. They've got all those phone numbers and all those people in their head. Um, and you see, when you go to this school, and I, I hung out for a year in Union City, and about a third of the time I spent in one classroom, third grade immigrant, immigrant kids, learning English while they prepped for the first of the big <coughs> tests. And so I watched what happened. The parents came in. Immigrant parents tend to be deferential to schools. You know, we don't know anything. You know everything. Uh-uh. That was not the way it, it worked. You got, and they would show parents how to connect with their kids. Have your child read to you. Have your child do math, simple math problems which you can figure out. Make sure that your child does the homework. You check it off so that, so that you are part of what that story is about. Give your child some space, even if it's a tiny corner of the table where you're eating, some space where they can actually do work. And the parents get it. Um, Parents' Day at schools in urban settings like this one are usually really sparsely attended. People do not go. It was a pouring down, rainy day, four weeks into the semester. You had an assembly, and then you had the parents there, and what you had, 90% of those parents, you know, or the, or the tia, or the abuela, or the somebody in the family, there for the kid. And, when, and that says a whole lot about you know, the ability to make those kinds of connections. Um, the high school is the last part of the system to get reformed. High school teachers are teaching subjects. They're not teaching. They're not paying attention to the teaching part of the story. So Kirp's law is that teachers who teach the youngest, if you go from youngest kids to oldest kids, you go from best teaching to worst teaching, Least prestige to most prestige, least pay to most pay. So, I mean, I, I complained gently about the configuration of this room. It's a terrible room for teaching. You know, you've got all these sort of heads back there, you know, do an arc around the classroom. They do tables. I mean, everything's done in, in project form, not for the high school. High school teachers say, I teach biology, I teach calculus, you know, I teach American history, leave me alone. And they had the attitude of, what can you expect from these kids when the graduation rates were terrible? And that has changed. Obviously, it's changed a lot. You get 91% graduation rate. Something great has happened. But they're not done. Here's the secret of these exams. When you look at, if you're, if you're you know, at the point which you've got kids and you're thinking about where you might want to live, and you look at how the schools are doing, and you look at the graduation rates, if students score proficient on their exams. They barely skate through. They have about the equivalent of a ninth grade education. 
They're going to go to community college. They're going to take remedial courses. They're going to drop out. I mean, the odds against them are huge. Something less than a third of community college students graduate from community college. And if you look at inner cities, you know, you look, you, you know, you look at the inner city schools in, let's say, LA, the four-year schools, the graduation rates are 16%, 20%. Um, there's a university, in public university in New Orleans, the graduation rate is 4%. Um, this is not a black-white issue. Look at Kent State, very white school. The graduation rate is 9%. Um, these kids aren't prepared. So what the school is doing to raise expectations is they're not just going to do the standard state test. Everybody's going to take the preliminary SAT, which all of you took way back when, and not so way back when, in high school. And it's just a signal. You know, we're going to set the bar a whole lot higher. Everybody isn't going to do brilliantly on that exam, but that's where we're pushing for. And the top folks, you know, are working for Google or its equivalent around. They're winning Gates Millennium Scholarships. They're winning National Science Fairs. They're going to all the Ivy League schools. They're fabulous. And the school district got to be rich enough that it is now offering three years of Mandarin. Um, the theory being bilingual is cool, trilingual, Spanish, Chinese, English, wow, I mean, you've got an amazing person there. And they're not, again, they're not done. So adding incrementally up the grades and then shifting at the margin, the way they're now educating immigrant kids who come in not as youngsters, but when they're in eighth or ninth grade and they've got a, a year's worth of education, they can't find their country on the map, they can barely spell their name, they've got four years to catch up with all the academic stuff, four years to learn English, and four years to learn America. Half of those kids graduate from high school. That's astonishing. That's, about, that's way better than the graduation rate for Latinos <coughs> in urban communities. Um, all of them, not just, not just new immigrant kids. Three of the top 20 students in the class of 2013 came to the US five years earlier, knowing no English. So I told that story. I spent the year. I told that story. And I knew what would happen, which was people would say, that's a really cool story, but, right? But Union City is different, and therefore, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with us. So I went looking around at every piece of research I could find on school districts that beat the demographic odds. That is, the achievement rate, achievement levels were higher, and the achievement gap was narrower than you'd expect if you looked at the composition of who the students were. I looked at a brilliant study by Tony Breich, who's over here now at the Stanford Center for Study of Education and Teaching. Um, what did he find? The Chicago public schools that did better than you'd expect. The same kind of thing that I've described in Union City. And a community of trust and high expectations, true there, true in Chicago. National survey of 100 successful school districts. What did they do? You don't see charter schools. You don't, with respect, see a lot of Teach for America teachers. Nothing against Teach for America, but they parachute into a community which they don't get. They spend two years and they leave. And if you've got a stable system, that's a disruptive influence, not a great influence. So some places they're fabulous, not in the, the real success stories. I looked at Places that were big, medium size and little. Sanger, California, small community. Aldine, Texas. Nobody here has heard of Aldine, Texas. Right? It's bigger than Washington, D.C., bigger than Boston. It's Houston's poor cousin. California doesn't spend enough on public education. Not nearly enough. Something like $8,500. That's $2,000 less than the national average. Aldine has $7,500. <coughs> to spend. If you go to visit school and you take a cup of coffee, you put a quarter in the plate that's there. They're, they're saving every penny. They've got a graduation rate that is slightly higher than the national average. That is a 60% Latino, 35% black, 5% white town. So I looked at communities that are predominantly African American and, and mixed, as in that case, white, African American, Asian, Latino communities. I looked at places that had teachers unions and didn't. By the way, in states that are unionized, you look at the same student population, the students do slightly better 
than in states where the teachers are not unionized. Elected school boards, appointed school boards, anything I could think of. And I found all of them doing variations of the same thing. They don't, talk, they don't know each other, by and large. I mean, nobody had, nobody had heard of, of Union City, and surely nobody heard about Aldean, Aldean, Texas, or Sanger, or Long Beach, and what they've been doing, Gardena, really good school districts. They all have one thing in common. And this is where I want to end the talk part and invite you to, to, to ask questions about any of this, any of what's going on in school reform today. They all have stability. You know, and that turns out, you know, I, stability is hugely important and not just in education. I read a little piece about what does the MBA have to teach educators? Well, look at who the top two teams were last time around. They both, the two teams and the finalists, they both had coaches that had been there for a good long time and, and general managers who'd been there for a good long time. They had a plan in place as opposed to the teams that are doing the revolving door coach. You're not going to find winners there. So Union City, any of these towns have stable school leadership. It's tough to get. School boards are comprised of politicians, many of whom want to do other things. They want to move up the ladder. That's the entry job. And they think they can do it by finding the miracle worker superintendent. They bring him or her in. She doesn't work a miracle. There are no miracles. She doesn't work a miracle. She lasts a couple of years, three years, and she's fired. The average tenure for an urban school superintendent is 2.6 years. I don't care how good you are as a leader. You can't turn around a complex organization like a school system. And I, Google is a complicated organization. This is peanuts. This is the easiest place in the world to think about reorganizing compared to, let's say, the Los Angeles or San Francisco school districts. So we're an impatient people. You know, we want to get stuff fast. We want to get stuff happening now. It's not going to work. So the question for Americans is they think about the future of the education of their kids. Obviously, really, really important is is this one of those cases? Can we accept the fact that sometimes Aesop is right, sometimes the tortoise does actually beat the hare? So that's the question I want to leave you guys with, and let's you know, see, where, see where we go from that. Anything you want to talk about, you're good. I like your point about like, stability in the school system and kind of how that is effective. I'm wondering if you can talk about kind of maybe where like what the transition looks like for communities that have gone from a not so great system to this more stable system. Like how yep. do we say, you know, this isn't just the ideal, but like how do we get How there? did it happen? It's a great question because and it happens in a variety of ways. It, it, for one thing, these school districts weren't always great school districts, any of them. Montgomery County, Maryland, which is some very rich people and some very poor people, 90 different languages spoken in the schools of Montgomery County, had revolving door superintendents. They bring in somebody, and he says, here's, the metric, here's what I'm going to show you by way of results. A couple of years down the road, you're going to have improved reading scores, and more kids in the high schools are going to be going to advanced placement classes, and on and on. So he did it. That happened. And the school board said, God, that's cool. Let's keep him in place, and let's provide some more money for the schools. More money, more stability. It's a virtuous circle that gets created. In some communities of, of relatively small size or relatively homogeneous communities, the, the leadership gets together and it's pushed by pride, local pride, pushed by the reality that they need to do better they actually improved themselves in, in um, Texas, that, that, town, that town in Texas. The business community said, you know, we can't hire your graduates. They don't know anything. They can't read. They can't write. They can't do math. School system said, and Aldine said, that's, you know, that's terrible. That's a terrible situation. And what happened in Aldine and what happens in these other successful school districts, they develop a rigorous curriculum and it's the teachers who are very engaged in developing this curriculum. And it's the same curriculum for all the schools, at least at the elementary and middle school level. Why? Very simple. Poor families move 
two or three times in the course of a year. You have one brilliant teacher and one brilliant school, they're going off in this direction, that kid moves to another school, maybe it's also a brilliant school, but it's doing something totally different, the kid is lost. So they build horizontally and they build vertically. When I was in school, and I, you know, I thought that's kind of obvious, you have work of increasing sophistication as you go up the, the ladder, but I remember, remember that when I was in English class and I was in the eighth or ninth grade, a teacher proudly said, we're gonna read Old Man and the Sea this year. I had read Old Man and the Sea in the seventh grade and I had read Old Man and the Sea in the eighth grade, so here we were in the ninth grade and I could probably recite it in my sleep. That doesn't go on there. But something, there's some catalyst. A new school board comes in and it gets the idea that we need to, we are listening to somebody who isn't over-promising. And that winds up taking hold. But every one of these places has a different story. Sanger, California, things were so bad in Sanger, a little town outside of Fresno, that there was a billboard as you came into town that said, anybody thinking about teaching, forget it, leave, drive through this town, terrible for teachers. I mean, imagine the teachers putting up, you know, investing that kind of money to express their hatred of where they were, <coughs> where they were working. It's like, you know, sign out here that says, go to Apple, get out of here, you know? Yeah. Not gonna happen. <coughs> Now, you have a very different, very, very different school system. You know, you look at what's going on and the teachers are on the same page as the principals are on the same page as the superintendent. Why? Because they're, they, they are engaged in the common mission, they get it, they respect one another. You get a, a superintendent to, who, over a period of time, wins the trust of the people who are there in the system. That's a windy answer to a, to a very good question, but it doesn't have a simple answer. So you made the point earlier that um, a lot of people are saying we're using 19th century teaching in the 21st century. So can you talk about some of the things that you saw that moved into 21st century teaching? And to piggyback on that, maybe like technology integration in what the a, What a strange question to come from this audience. I would never have expected a question about technology here. But I'm so, it's a plant almost. So here's, in the early, in the mid 1990s, as Union City was getting out of its total slump, a very entrepreneurial group in the administration. And when Atlantic Bell said, we want to see what happens if you give laptops to eighth graders. We're talking about 1993, 1994. This was something quite special. And people said, are you kidding? Laptops for these kids? They're poor. They'll steal them. They'll sell them. They'll make some money. Which, if you think about it, would have been a perfectly rational response. Never happened. So they found that the school which had laptops for its eighth graders, the kids did better, they liked school more, they were more engaged, the parents saw the kids as more engaged, the, uh, the phone company wanted to take the computers away, the district persuaded them to leave the computers with the kids so they could keep using those computers. National Science Foundation evaluated, <coughs> funded the evaluation of that study. So when the book came out in the spring, I was invited to give a talk about Union City, because they're very proud, right? This is National Science Foundation, STEM, all that stuff. And I said to them what I'd say to you, which is Union City has made then and since smart use of technology. But it realizes that technology is not a solution for anything unless people can make sense of it. You know, handing out iPads to every kid in Los Angeles is crazy. It's a crazy use of money. You think about the other things that you could do to support education, education there. So what I said to the folks at, at NSF was, Union City has made really good, smart use of technology. But you know, there's a place for technology, but technology has its place. And if nobody had invented the computer, I would be here today telling you how great Union City and these other districts were. So they, they figured out how to integrate it. If you look at the data, you know, just simple, you know, technology-aided instruction versus not, not very impressive. A lot of money spent, not very good results. If you look at examples where the technology becomes embedded in the curriculum, that's great. They're moving to an all on, you know, get rid of textbooks, put everything on, you know, on the tablet. Fabulous, it's great, they love it. Kids love it, they love it. I like your idea of the consensus-driven uh, approach to stability, but I can imagine that takes a little bit of time, if not a lot. Um, how do you keep the people involved, including management, patient, like you were saying, 
um, until you get the results you desire. I think the management, the folks who are running the system, if they're the right people, they get it. But one of the things, a typical school district, you know, when, when a sociologist at Stanford developed what's called the garbage can theory of organizations, which is, you know, it's kind of like this. He had schools in mind, herds of cats. That's a description of school systems. You've got to build a system out of, out of build a, a school system out of a system of schools. So one of the things they do is twice a year, the superintendent and top staff visit the principal and the top staff in the school. And the conversation is always the same. It's right out of my discussion of high scope preschool education or Edward Deming. Where were you when we last talked? It's October. Where were you in March? Let's review the, the bidding. Where are you now? You had, a, you had some things you wanted to address. Where are you now? And what's next? What do you want next? Where are you going next? And how can we help you? How can we support you? Um, so it really is a philosophy that gets embedded in folks. And the, the patience factor is key. In a town near Union City that is 95% black, um, the new school board looked at Union City and said, that's what we want. And so they recruited some top folks there. And they started with preschool and working their way up the ladder, changing the method of teaching, changing the materials, encouraging collaboration, doing frequent assessments. Lo and behold, test scores started going up. People started being happier. You know, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade scores improving. And that's, by the way, how you keep folks interested. You look, because it starts at the bottom, and see what's happening to those students. So what happens in this town? The old guard wins the next school board election. They throw out the Union City model. They go back to the way things used to be. You look at test scores, they've gone right back down. So it takes patience on the part of administrators um, who I think get it. I mean, you don't change somebody. If I walk into any you know, small organization here and say, we're going to do things really differently from now on. You know, we're gonna, there's going to be more collaboration, less collaboration. You're going to be working on this kind of project, not that kind of project. You're going to be reporting in this way and not that way. It takes some time before people get their heads around that. Teachers have a way of teaching. They've got, I mean, just again, think back to elementary school, secondary school, college. They have a way of teaching. It's not something that you change overnight. They get it. It's whether the politicians in the town get it, whether the teachers are willing to trust the person who's saying, you got to change. And that's why Union City didn't bring in some publishing company to say, OK, this is what you're going to do. What they do is they have a group of teachers from the school system working together to borrow bits and pieces of the best stuff that's out there. And so the teacher is going to say, cool. These folks are like me. They understand Union City. If that's what they think we should be doing, I'm going to be much more receptive to it. So that's also part of the story. Question about funding sources, right? So uh, an article in New York Times yesterday talked about what's quite clearly uh, the discrepancy between rich school districts and poor school districts and how we fund schools. And <laughs> the structure that we currently have is a lot of local funding that comes from property taxes and revenue and state funded things. Most developed countries have an even distribution of money across school systems in their specific countries. In the US, we don't have that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the money issue? And, and, and without becoming a socialist country, how do we, how do we solve that problem? How well, you do we know, it's, inter that? it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that people don't know about Richard Nixon, because he was such an unappealing person with such unappealing rhetoric, is that more good social programs happened during the Nixon years than certainly have happened since. There's nobody in the Nixon cabinet who'd get a job in the Obama cabinet. Too liberal. And there was a commission report which said we need a national you know, formula for the distribution of money. And we do. Um, you know, as you know, very hard to get the 50 states to agree on anything. The Common Core curriculum is the current example. You've got about 40 states that signed up for this um, curriculum. Imposed from the top. Well, see Obamacare, right, and the problems that it, is, that it is, has generated. Some states, lawsuits have produced greater equalization. I think the Times piece discusses that. Um, but lawsuits are pretty blunt 
instruments. Um, there are a crowd that says money doesn't matter. Um, that you know, class size doesn't matter, money doesn't matter. Well, again, you think about those, on the one hand, the Union City kids who've got the option of three years of Chinese and many other interesting things. It's a forensics class. There was a, kind, there was a body on the floor, a fake body on the floor when I walked into this, and everybody is CSI in that, in that class. Uh -huh. And you contrast that with what goes on in Aldean, Texas. So in Aldean, Texas, they want priests. Everybody in every one of these great school districts wants preschool, valorizes preschool. But they don't have enough money for two years of preschool. They don't have enough money for a year of preschool for everybody. So they have a year of preschool for the poorest of the poor. That's inexcusable. We, there was a commission on equity appointed by Arne Duncan, chaired by Chris Edley, the, the recent dean of Berkeley Law School. And they wrote a report. It's a good report. It went no place. The frame of reference now, the frame of reference is competition markets. Equity, very hard to get folks interested in equity. So it's an interesting question as to how you change the conversation. And there are efforts out there to, to do that. But until people start framing what goes on in school differently, we're stuck with a really unhappy system that you described. And that Times article, which appeared, I think, yesterday, is very much worth reading on that score. Uh, so you were talking about um, introducing um, better approaches early preschool and then working its way up. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage the, the graduation of kids, let's say, from elementary school into middle school, and now they're being introduced several years advanced from their, from their peers? You do what you can. Um, I mean, you don't, there, out there as well, there is the notion that zero to five is everything. You know, that's where, and in fact, if you look at, in, in terms of, you know, what the amount of gr brain growth and the amount of, of social and emotional development, those are key years, but you really can't, obviously. You can't say, okay, five-year-old, you didn't get it, you know, you're doomed for the rest of your life. Although there are, if you look at the way people talk about this stuff, it, it can feel like that. So you're not giving up on those other grades by any means. Montgomery County, developed a really good preschool first grade, second grade program, and also vastly expanded the advanced placement program in the poor schools as well as the middle schools. But you can't do everything at once, unfortunately. And so some people lose out. It's a great equity exercise. If I'm a teacher, I'm a, in a classroom, my resource is time, right? And this is something, you might have fun talking about this. My resource is time. Do I divide it equally among all the students? Do I focus on the kids who are leaping ahead so that they don't get bored? Do I focus on the kids who are really trying hard, rewarding effort? Do I look at the social backgrounds of those kids and figure out where am I going to invest my energies? Am I going to focus on trying to acknowledging that these kids need more? How am I going to do this? Um, that's the problem that any school district is going to face, or a version of that problem. Where do you focus most of your energies? Because you can't do it all at once. People hate making, prior, making trade off decisions. But unfortunately, if there's an infinite amount of money, there's no trade offs, but there's, you know, there's nothing to talk about. And for sure, there's not an infinite amount of money in, in education. I had a question about change agents and thinking about the different school districts that you've looked at. Um, there are certainly um, a number of partners that contribute to these shifts, and mm -hmm. it may be these administrators in the school district, or it may be business leaders. What are the sort of, what are the largest trends that you've noticed across these districts in terms of change agents? Also a really good, what I love about the Q&A part of talking is I'm going to get questions that I've never gotten before, so you, I get to think in, in real time. And that's been true of several of the, of the questions today. I don't know that there is a pattern. I think a lot depends on who the respected members of the community are. If you take a city the size of, oh, let's say Mountain View, you can gather all the folks who matter in terms of these decisions around a table. 
and you can talk through what needs to be done. And that happens in these communities. There may be a community foundation that gets interested in this set of issues. I was in Norfolk recently, the high school, one of the high schools in Norfolk, and that school district went from best to worst. You know, they were one of the high schools that Eli Broad, one of the districts that Eli Broad said, outstanding urban district of the year, 2007. Now, half the schools are about to be taken over by the state and the district is suing the state. And so, how did it happen is question one. But there's a community with one very wealthy woman, the heir to a fortune from the guy who had the local newspaper, but more interestingly, founded the weather station. And a lot of money from the weather station. And she's committed to this enterprise so she can bring people together. You know, you get an invitation from her, you're not going to turn it down. And she can also put money in those efforts and, and get other people to do so as well. One company does something, another company feels it has to follow suit. One community does something, another community feels it has to follow suit. Tulsa, Oklahoma is a really interesting town in terms of what it's done for kids from parenting all the way through high school. Its rival is Oklahoma City, always. So Oklahoma City looks at Tulsa and says, hey, if they can do it, we can do it better. So, you know, if I were in France, there are such neat answers to these questions. It is, change the Minister of Education. You've got to work at implementation on the ground. That's it. Change the Minister of Education, and things are going to change at the school level. Here, it's a very, very messy universe. So when I work with funders, or people from business folks who've made a lot of money, and want to be, really want to spend money improving the education of kids, there's this natural frustration because it isn't one neat, simple, straightforward system. So you've got to look around for innovations, reforms that have some evidence behind them and that you can actually generalize because communities are so different. I say to folks, this innovation has to survive in the tundra and in the jungle if it's going to succeed generally. And that's tough to do, and it's, it's tough to convince folks that there isn't some simple, straightforward answer to those questions. But those are some, some thoughts about, about that question. Does that sort of cover the waterfront? The background I was coming to the question with was thinking about public-private partnerships and the role mm -hmm. that seems to be playing in public education reform within the past three to five years. So knowing that that seems to be a yep. large trend. Right, and part of, that's part of what I'm describing. And it's ve they're very, because private, you know, nonprofits and businesses bring resources and talent and brain power and know-how that the schools can use. And the trick is to negotiate that relationship, to make it work. San Francisco's problem is that everybody, everybody wants to solve San Francisco's problems. Everybody thinks they have the right answer. Some people because they're going to make money with their answer. Some people because they want to do good with their answer. San Francisco has to figure out a way of saying, whoa, we've got to organize this, which is tough because if the system says no, then the group goes to the school. And if the school can't take it on, you go to your favorite board of supervisor member or your favorite board of education member. So it's a great resource. I mean, if you, if you, I don't know what Google does in this area, for example, but I can imagine many, many, many things that Google could do, some of them not obvious. You guys would make great mentors to, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth graders. No tech. Just, you know, or maybe tech actually, because you bring that, they're interested. But whatever it is that, that sort of plays in that relationship, that's crucial. If you ask people in the kid business what's the most important thing you can do for a youngster, provide a caring, stable adult in their lives. And somebody who's your age can do a whole lot closer to more, you know, more able to connect to a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old than somebody of my age. So that's part of an answer to where business partnerships should go. Really pay attention to what the public structure is. Appreciate that the constraints on a school system, which has to take everybody. Just imagine if Google had to hire everybody who wanted to come work here. I, you know, look, I went to community college. I've got an AA in computer science. You know, hire me. Probably not going to happen. But in the schools, you take everybody. Um, 
You understand those constraints, but you move on to figure out the school system is smart. It's going to realize what the talent looks like and take advantage of it. And as you say, more and more of that's happening. Um, you mentioned about um, um, Union School District is so successful. Now, uh, are all the school districts in the country aware of the successful story? And then what are the challenges they have in terms of following up that um, model? So, in a sense, my answer to that question is like my answer to the last question. In a sane world, everybody, every school district would know what Union City is up to. And, you know, you write something like this as a way of getting the word out, and it's picked out by school board, you know, state school boards, associations, and superintendents associations. But there is no one channel. Everybody wants to coordinate. Right? That's everybody wants to coordinate all the stuff out there. Coordination is a power term. It isn't just something in the air. Somebody coordinates somebody else. So that's one part of the answer. Having said that, there are a lot of school folks who've come to Union City. What do I do? I did a piece about you know, this book in 1,200 words in the New York Times. Lots of people descended on <coughs> Union City. And some of them have adopted what they're doing. So the good news is they can all do it. Nothing fancy here. Nothing they didn't already know. The tough news is they have to keep doing it. They can't give up for a minute. It doesn't just coast. There's no free ride. There's no hurrah, we made it, celebration. And that's really what happens. And again, a school board gets impatient and brings in somebody else with her miracle, then you're off to the races again and you've got problems. But I could wish. I really, I mean this seriously, the world had a straightforward answer to the, to the question of how you spread things nationwide. I, however, if you really want to make a difference in school matters, look at, the city, look, at the, look at the school district level. Look at the community. That's where the big impact is going to be. Um, even bigger in the schools if you want to be that micro. The states, sure, there are things that states do that matter a lot. We now have a thanks to Jerry Brown, the way in which funds are redistributed are more money to poor districts, more money to English language learners, more money to kids with special needs than to middle class and rich districts from the state. The districts get to decide how they're going to spend that money. So they can certainly use help. This goes back to your question about equalizing funding. They can certainly use help in that area. So if you care about education, right now, the worst place to go is Washington, D.C. When I was a kid, on my report card, it said, works and plays well with others. That was one category. F for everybody out there, right? They all get Fs. They all fail that there. State, a whole lot more is happening. Local districts, exciting stuff going on. And that's really where you guys can have the uh, biggest impact. And I hope you do. So I, I, I love giving talks to smart folks and engaged folks. Um, and the fact I, I'm enough of a teacher to be able to read the audience and you know, folks who left, left because they had other stuff to do and the people who were here are still very much with the conversation. I'll be really happy if three of you do something significant around education that in some way or other, you know, this talk started the wheel spinning. And I'm happy to be of help. You can find me easily. You can, as they say, Google me. Uh, <laughs> thanks.